Well, it's 2015 and science fiction has become science fact. Things that were predicted in movies like The Terminator or Minority Report or even 1984 are now coming to fruition. Do we really have such little control over our reality? Are we being programmed for this dystopic future all along? Or do we really have such little humanity left in us that we're willingly giving it away to our robot overlords? Well, my guest today, John Rappaport of nomorefakenews.com says, no, it's not all predictive programming, but our controllers just don't want us to know that we still have the power to create the reality that we desire. So John, thank you so much for joining the show today. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of your recent articles, Not Everything is Predictive Programming. We are always seeing these, these movies with their dystopic futures and with the robocops and pre-crime, and yet still every single day, people are lining up to get the new biometric cell phone and some, you know, something that's gonna enslave them with, with all of this futuristic type stuff. And so it's kind of hard to say, well, it, that those type of movies and science fiction and stuff aren't preparing us for this future when it seems that that's exactly what we're being corralled into. So talk to me about everything not being specifically predictive programming. Well, certainly a lot is. Let's get that straight. Um, movies in Hollywood, nature, blockbusters, science fiction, that sort of thing. We certainly do see programming that are pre that is preparing people for a mechanized, robotic, mind-controlled, uh, horrific future. And they turn these blockbusters out all the time. And one of the reasons they do that is because they make money. Some of them make gigantic amounts of money. But you can go overboard with that to the point where you could say everything that's ever been done in the field of science fiction is predictive programming because it postulates futures, alternative futures. And that's the upside. Because if you're awake and alert and you're reading science fiction novels or seeing some science fiction, it stimulates your own imagination so that in the end, you begin to consider different possibilities for yourself and everybody else. Futures that can be created that don't exist now that we're not locked into. That was the original purpose of science fiction. That was the whole idea, that it could forestall certain horrific futures and open up people's minds to the possibility of inventing futures that would be much better for all of us. But you see, if people don't even know they have imaginations because in their schooling, training, indoctrination, and so forth, they've been basically taught to devalue it to say, well, it's just a toy for children, and now I'm grown up, and now I have to do other things, then everything, and I can't stress this too much, then everything they take in from the world has a component of mind control in it, because they are passive. They don't access their own imagination. A person with an active imagination can look at any number of predictive programming, movies, TV series, and so forth, and not be affected by that at all. Because they understand this is a product of somebody's imagination. Well, I have imagination too. And I can envision all kinds of other things. You see, that's part of what is creating this robotic society in the first place, is the fact that so many people don't seem to understand that they have a very powerful imagination that can conceive of futures for the human race, multiple futures, and their own personal futures for themselves, mm -hmm. what they would really like to be doing, like to be uh, exploring. That's a big problem in society, a gigantic problem. Yeah, absolutely, especially since so many people from a very young age now are constantly tapped into technology. And I had a discussion with someone that they said, you know, they thought video games and things like that really helped to spur people's imagination and help them conceive these alternate realities, which is, you know, something that you also mentioned science fiction is able to do. But at the same time, 
they're not really using their own imagination. They're just sub submerging themselves in this reality that someone has created for them. And so they're not actually getting out there and allowing them their minds to wander. And children or those that aren't awake don't realize that they are being subjected to a little bit of programming. So they might not even realize that they're not actually using their imagination, but they're being programmed. So talk to me a little bit about how, you know, if you aren't aware of that, how are some ways that they can sort of bypass your brain functions to sell you this reality? Visual images are very powerful. You know, kids become obsessed with these video games. Mm -hmm. That's a clue. That's called a clue. You know, when you're playing a game five, six hours a day, something is happening there that is and training your mind your brain to operate along certain rhythms with certain directions narrow directions intensely focused on as you say what somebody else is creating for you it's the same in the political sphere or in the sphere of a major media if you watch the news every night and you're not aware that you have any creative power of your own or imagination of your own, then everything you take in becomes programmed. The voice of the anchor, the material that they're feeding you, the lies, the omissions, the lack of context, the whole ball of wax becomes nothing more than programming. Your life, <laughs> you know, your existence, the world, are all elements of mind control and programming for people who are not cognizant of the fact that they have creative power of their own. Right. That's, a, that's the bottom line on this. And so it becomes imperative for people to wake up and understand that, hey, I can invent things myself without any input from anybody else. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that you mentioned in one of your articles. I, I bring this up a lot uh, just in general speaking with people, but everything that we think is reality was at one time just in someone's mind. Someone thought, you know, hey, I'd like to be able to sit down without falling on the ground and they visualized a chair and then eventually that chair was manifested and now there's chairs everywhere, there's buildings everywhere. Um, so you, I think you mentioned in your article, it's just sort of a uh, we all agree it's some it's a reality it's manifested we we agree on it uh, we agree that it's there and it doesn't necessarily have to be what is real but people don't even understand that they have the power to create something entirely new i mean it's not a good thing that people are spending 5 10 15 hours a day in a virtual a virtual world there isn't a problem with that if your world is so bad that you've got to be tapped into a video game or something, that's not right. And I think that that's um, probably one of the big issues here with controlling people is they want people to be in this virtual world because then they can't ever manifest uh, something brand new. They can't ever change the reality that's being built up around them because there are a lot of people that are really invested in keeping this reality that they've worked so hard on for centuries real. And then if we don't ever realize our own power to be able to change that reality. Um, so, and the, speaking of that, I know I sent you this article as well, the Daily Mail. We know Facebook and, and Google and these, they're very <laughs> intrusive in our lives. But here they're working on uh, saying virtual reality done right can be observed as reality. And they talk a lot about how, you know, these are just optical illusions and our, we, they can trick our brain and how neat this is and they're doing all this investigating. But Facebook, we already know their whole mission is to make it so th they want to be the portal into the internet so that you never have to leave Facebook. And now they're talking about creating a virtual reality so that you never have to leave this virtual reality. And my goodness, I've seen a lot of science fiction movies that are just like this. So is this what's happening? And I mean, what do you think about this? It's horrendous. And it's exactly as you say. But, you know, optical illusions are very old. When I was a kid, I used to have a book of black and white op uh, optical illusions. And they would say, look at this picture and you see this line is curved, right? 
No, it isn't. It's straight. So from that, they infer, look, we can give you a certain amount of limited visual data, and your brain will supply the rest. And we can predict what your brain is going to supply. So we can present you with cues and triggers and partial amounts of data, and you will fill in the rest. And that's true. On an automatic basis, that's what happens. And Facebook is very interested in that because, as you say, they want people to consider that Facebook is the Internet and they want to keep you there. In fact, they're now negotiating with media giants to present content on Facebook from, say, the New York Times, where you don't click a link and go to the Times. The Times displays some of its content right there on Facebook. So you are there all the time. But what they're basically trying to do is trigger automatic reflexes. And again, this works with people who have no consci uh, consciousness of the fact that they have their own creative imaginations. Because if they don't, then they just are passive receptors and they take in everything that is presented to them. This is ideal for the controllers of societies. This is what they want. That's why curriculum in the schools has never been tuned to the idea of imagination. Mm -hmm. That's why colleges never get involved with that subject as, in a serious way in order to stimulate the imagination of students. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want people running around who can look at reality and say, well, that's all well and good, but you see, I my goal is to invent something else, mm -hmm. something different. So. You know, in a population of 300 million people, if all of a sudden you had, I don't know, 75,000 people who were actively inventing other realities, much more interesting realities, and I don't mean mind-controlled realities, but different paths that individuals could take that would make them more powerful, more perceptive, more alive, and so on, more creative then we would begin to have a kind of open society, not the lockdown society that we have now. And then people would desert the news, uh, mainstream news, in even greater numbers than they are now. They would desert video games. They would desert the, the theaters, the movie theaters would largely empty out, except for what is real art. Because people would say, well, you know, I don't have to go to a museum all the time, and I'm using that metaphorically, to see painting. I can paint myself. Mm -hmm. Now the worm turns. Now the seesaw goes the other way. Now you have people who are taking a creative stance toward reality and saying, yes, everything we see around us was once imagination. Well, that's what I've got, too. Mm -hmm. So I can invent things that are not here now. And mostly I can invent my own future that isn't here now. I don't have to take my cues from somebody else or some official source or from the government or from mega corporations or from video game manufacturers. I don't have to do any of that because I'm free of that because I know that I have the capacity to invent something different. And by the way, when that revelation comes, people do not live in fear anymore. Fear is not their main emotion. Fear comes when you feel trapped, when you feel there's nothing that can be done. You feel we're, we've lost. There's nowhere to go. The, you know, the major players have taken over and we're just spinning wheels until we become complete slaves. The fear of all that goes away. Right. And that's a fantastic thing. And fear as a vibrational energy doesn't go very far. It keeps you locked in. It keeps you right where you are. You're sort of paralyzed. And that's why people, when they see fearful messages on the news and everything, they're just locked into whatever the news is telling them, rather than just turning it off and going outside and looking and seeing that it's actually a really lovely day outside. And maybe you could actually do something about this perpetual state of war that the government seems to be continually dragging us into. And now I wanted to um, talk a little bit about something some people can do. Now I know that uh, in Davos, they just had the Davos Forum there in Switzerland, 
And one of the big sold out events that was there um, was a, a daily meditation practice. So here we have all of these powerful people just packing themselves into this room uh, where they're being taught how to just sit silently for 10 minutes to visualize. And this is what they're being told is that that's what's gonna give them a leg up against their competition. Uh, we, we hear a lot about athletes doing this, just really visualizing, you know, winning the, the game and all of that, of really going through the whole process of it and visualizing themselves winning. Uh, so this is something that obviously they know there's so much power of the imagination to really be able to create a reality and here they're teaching that. But like you said, that's not really being taught in the schools. That's not being taught uh, to children or even to adults who have lost lost this sense of magic and knowing that they can create a better reality for themselves. So talk to me a little bit about, you know what, I'm just going to give you the floor. I'm going to let you close out the segment and you can answer that question. And then if you have any sort of imagination exercises that you uh, can share with the audience, John Rappaport, nomorefakenews.com. Okay. Well, what you say is very true. If you can see something before it happens, something that you're going to do, but not just see it, actually play it out, a scenario, not just once, but a number of times, things can change. For example, this exercise to somebody. He said to me, okay, I'm getting married and there's going to be a dinner before the wedding. You know, just a kind of prosaic sort of thing. And he said, the idea of this dinner, the families, everybody sitting around, just induces panic in me. So I want to be able to do something about it. And I said, okay, so try this. You sit there, you know, wherever you are. And you play out the scene. You're walking into the restaurant. You see your fiance. You walk up. You give her a kiss. You're introduced to her family. They meet your family. You sit down. You begin to eat dinner. Conversation flows back and forth. The dinner is over. You stand up, et cetera, et cetera. And you finally leave the dinner. Play that scenario out all the way. And then when you're done, do it again. And when you're done, do it again. And you will notice that certain things come up, little moments where, oh, I don't know about this one, I'm not sure. Make those moments work in your imagination the way you want them to work. Keep on inventing that scenario of the wedding dinner until it seems, you know, fairly ordinary and doable. And that's exactly what he did. And he came back to me later. He said it was a piece of cake because he had previewed it in detail a number of times. And as he put it, he sort of worked out the wrinkles by changing what could have been a fearful moment into something that worked. Very simple thing. It works. It's doable. Here's something that's even wilder and more, I think, fun. Make a list. Work on this maybe 10, 15 minutes a day. At the top of the page or at the top of the screen in a file or whatever, put down things I would never want to do in my life. And be as you know, prosaic or wild and, uh, you know, extreme as you want to be. Just write a list. And in some cases, instead of just a little item, you might you know, I'll write a paragraph about that crazy thing that I would never want to do. You know, I would never want to go to the moon in my underwear. And you begin to think, well, this is ridiculous, but just keep on going. Things I would never want to do in my life. If you do this for maybe a month or two every day for about 15 or 20 minutes, you might be surprised that suddenly out of the hopper, spontaneously, arises an idea and you say, well, wait a minute, maybe that is actually something I would want to do in my life. At that point, stop and write about that. I've had a number of people and I've developed hundreds of imagination exercises for people who have come to what 
they really want to create in the future and with just that little exercise. All of a sudden, boom, it hits them. Wow. At that moment, the person suddenly realizes that this is not something I would ever want to do. Wait a minute, no. This might be something that I truly want to do. And I can see myself doing it. In fact, this could become my entire future, a major fantastic future where I create what I truly want to create, not only for myself, but for other people as well. It revolutionizes their life, and it all starts with this simple act of imagination and doing this exercise. This is the power of imagination. This is what people forget in their lives. And when they remember it, they experience enormous amounts of energies that have been repressed and shunted and buried, and they come back to themselves in full flower. That's a revolutionary change at the individual level, at the political level, economic level, at all levels for people. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It's a very simple, simple exercises, but so powerful. And that's what people need to realize is that it is time to break free of the programming. And it's as simple as just reprogramming your own thoughts and seeing the world the way you would like to see them, believing what it is that you think is real and not what people is just telling you. This is this is the reality you live in, period. You can never change, change it. So thank you so much, John, for joining us. Always good to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you.